Hi there. Today, I'm comparing two modern classics, the Moog Subsequent 37 and the Sequential Pro 3. And I hope that I can help you decide which one would be a better fit for you and your workflow beyond the spec sheet and from a real user's perspective after using both of them extensively for months and years in the case of the Moog. I want to tell you about the things that I feel that actually make a difference when considering which one to buy and not just make a technical side-by-side -side comparison nor an A-B sound test. What's really funny about this particular video is that I adore both of these machines and when I started writing out my notes I thought it would be a close fight but I was very surprised to find out that at least on paper one of these two seems to be a clear winner. If you're already a subscriber, huge welcome back, my friend, and thanks so much for hanging out with me today again. If this is your first time here, hi. Welcome to the Midlight Synthesis. Let's get started. The sound. Okay, so before we begin this, I just want to put out a little disclaimer on the table. When comparing the sounds between these two synths, you're basically comparing the best of the best. Ferrari and Lamborghini, Reese's peanut butter cups and Snickers bars. There really is no better sounding synth here. They're just different and they're both exceptionally good, just at slightly different things and in slightly different ways. So instead of just showing you 10 examples of the same bass pattern and A-B testing them, let me instead tell you all about what I feel actually does make a huge difference in how both of these beasts sound. The filters. If you love synthesizers, you owe it to yourself to own a Moog at some point in your life and just do this. The Moog Low Pass Ladder Filter is absolutely top tier, and here you get four different slopes to set it to. It's one of the things that gives Moog synthesizers its character, and on the subsequent especially, the filter is as rich as it is buttery smooth. It's no accident that this knob here is the biggest, because that's one of the reasons why this thing costs the big bucks. On the other side of the ring, we have the Pro 3 with its filters. And let me tell you, you would be sorely mistaken if you think it's any less impressive or tasty. You get three filters really on the Pro 3. Two low pass and a state variable one that goes from low pass to high pass and everywhere in between. The second low pass filter is also a ladder filter, like on the Moog. And I'd be lying if I told you that it sounds any less astounding than its competitor. So as far as filters go, points to Moog for character, points to Pro 3 for versatility. The second thing that makes these synths shine are their oscillators. Now, once again, it's a matter of taste whether you prefer Moog or sequential oscillators. But what I really think makes a huge difference here are not oscillators one and two, but rather oscillator number three on the Pro and the sub oscillator on the 37. In the case of the 37, the sub oscillator rounds out the sound with a seemingly bottomless low end and a fullness that I really can't say I've been able to make any other synth replicate well enough without breaking up when hitting those lower notes. I don't think many would disagree that this thing is the king of synthesized low end. On the other hand, the Pro 3's third oscillator is not analog, it's digital. A wavetable oscillator that can also be set to act as a fourth LFO. And that gives the Pro 3 not only an immensely wide range of sound possibilities, it adds a modern taste to it that really opens up the spectrum of what it can do, and it has become one of my favorite secret weapons in my sound shaping arsenal. So as far as oscillators go, points to Moog for low end growl, points to Pro 3 for the wider sound palette. Finally, the third most important difference in sound between these two are the effects. Regrettably, the subsequent 37 doesn't have any. So that $100 difference that you save up if you choose the 37 will probably be well spent adding a reverb or a delay pedal here or there to spice things up. Make no mistake, however, the 37 sounds absolutely stunning all on its own, but when you add just a touch of effects, the sky's the limit with this thing. just between us, if you're investing in a $1,900 synth at this point, there's a pretty good chance you already have a few pedals or effects plugins lying around, so it might not be an issue after all. The Pro 3, on the other hand, comes with a selection of effects to choose from, and you can use two of those effects per patch, which means you can really go full Sound Explorer on this thing. The best part is that they actually sound really good, and they add a lot to the sound. 
especially since the Pro 3 is in stereo. My favorites of the bunch are the Bucket Brigade Delay and the Plate Reaper. They complement the sound of the synth very nicely. And since you can modulate the effects parameters with the mod matrix of the Pro 3, it makes them extremely flexible and an integral part of the patches you design. So in the effects category, Pro 3 takes a prize and subsequent gets a participation certificate. I just want to take a quick second here because this video would not be possible if it wasn't for today's sponsor, the good folks over at Perfect Circuit. Perfect Circuit is a music store that sells all kinds of synthesizers, modular gear and effects pedals, among other audio things. Where I live, high quality synths like these are very hard to come by and I literally wouldn't be able to keep this channel going if it wasn't for their support. They're really passionate about music gear and it really shows when you reach out to them. If you happen to like any of the gear you see in my videos and want to buy some for yourself, please consider doing so with the affiliate links to Perfect Circuit down in the description below. That way you can support the channel and support Perfect Circuit, who in turn help me out and other creators like me keep the studio lights on. Thanks a lot. The workflow. After the sound, the most important thing for me in a synth is how I interact with it its user interface and the fluidity of use. A great thing about both of these synths is that they both offer small LED screens that display vital information at all times and that they're also chock full of dedicated controls. But there are a few fundamental differences here and there that might tip the scales in favor of one or the other. Both panels boast a plethora of knobs and buttons, which makes getting to know your way around them quite easy and quick. The main functions are mostly readily available on the faceplate, as well as very logically organized in different sections, so I don't find myself going into the submenus that often in either of these synths, unless it's to find something very specific once every now and then. The Sub-37's panel is pretty much iconic right about now, and I for one greatly appreciate that it's tilted, because it really does wonders for the ergonomics and the feeling that you're immersed in the machine while you're working on it. I do have one bit of fair criticism though, and that's that in low light situations, the LEDs really can get in the way of letting you see and read the labels clearly. The Pro 3 has a slightly larger panel with less of a tilt in the standard version. So if you do have some cash to burn, you can get the special edition one with the fully tilted panel and the wooden end cheeks. Me, I kind of like the aesthetics of the standard version more. Compared to some of the sections of the Sub-37, specifically the LFO section, it certainly feels less crammed and a bit easier to read. As for the screens, I once again favored the implementation of the Pro 3 over the 37. First, because it has dedicated knobs and buttons to navigate it, whereas on the 37, you have to wiggle the fine-tune knob to adjust the parameters, and you only have a few buttons to find your way around the pages. The brightness and contrast of the 37 screen, though adjustable, also makes it a bit more fatiguing on the eyes, but thankfully, you don't have to look at the screen that much when you're actually using it. Much to the contrary, the Pro 3 screen is a crucial part of the sound design and navigation experience. It's much easier on the eyes, and it serves as a secondary controller for fine-tuning parameters you have in other areas of the panel. Take the amplitude envelope, for example. By turning the attack knob on the envelope, the screen now changes to give me a visual representation of the envelope, as well as offering me instant access to four more pages that might be useful in context. It's these little details that give me the feeling that Sequential have really done their homework and have paid as much attention to engineering the sounds of their synths as they have the end user experience. This isn't to say that the UI in the subsequent is by any means flawed or subpar in comparison to most other synths on the market. It's just that I think that the Pro 3's UI is extremely exceptional. The sequencers. In general, I usually tend to not pay much attention to the built-in sequencers that come with most of my synths. Mainly because, in my experience at least, many of these sequencers are almost an afterthought and offer cumbersome workflows as well as limited capabilities compared to the average MIDI capable groove box. So if you do own one such groove box or a sequencer like the Electron Octatrack or the Poly and Play, or if you straight up do your sequencing from your DAW, using these built-in sequencers can be anything from redundant to downright frustrating. In the case of the Subsequent 37, I am very sad to report that it's very much the latter. My sincere apologies to all my fellow Moog fanboys out there, but let's be real here for a second. Moog makes some amazing sounding synths, but their sequencers are usually nothing to write home about, say perhaps the subharmonicon, but that's only because it's polyrhythmic. Truth be told, I've learned and forgotten how to use a sequencer on the Sub-37 multiple times by now, and that's just because it's just no fun. 
It relies heavily on button combos that unless you use very often or stick on a cheat sheet somewhere, you're bound to forget very quickly. So when you fire it up and you want to record or edit a sequence, you usually hit a brick wall early on because not all of these secondary functions are written on the front panel. The small screen and few control buttons don't help the experience either. So when it comes to sequencing on the Sub 37, I always do it externally. Once more, to be fair, that's the case for most of my gear, unless the onboard sequencer is exceptional. Well, the sequencer on the Pro 3 <laughs> is exceptional. <laughs> Not only do you get step sequencing of notes, you also have 16 lanes of modulation sequencing, as well as being able to sequence external gear through MIDI or CV. All this capability would be of little use if it was presented in a confusing or an intimidating way. But thankfully, the interface and workflow was made with actual human beings in mind. And thanks to a slew of dedicated buttons and knobs, as well as the ever useful LED screen on the Pro 3, it's surprisingly easy to come to grips with it. It's not just functional, it goes the extra mile to be genuinely inspiring. And the sequencer eggs you on to add more and more modulation and complexity to your track. If you've ever used a Digitac or a Digitone, you know what I mean. It's not just about recording a melody, it's making every step count and be a unique event. Finally, I wanted to touch a bit on the live performance and actual jamming that can be done on both of these synths. This is probably the most subjective difference I'll talk about today, but here goes. Before getting the Pro 3, the Subsequent 37 was my go-to mono synth for live playing or improvising. The combination of its stellar key bed and synth action, along with the superbly responsive aftertouch and easily accessible controls, was pretty much everything I needed to get in the zone. This has not changed, mind you. The Subsequent 37 is a phenomenal live performance machine. But once again, the Pro 3 just does it a little better. For starters, the screen is much easier to read in most lighting conditions, and it changes the information that it displays to whatever is related to the knobs that you're touching at that moment. So I always feel I know exactly what's going on when I start moving something around. As I said before, knobs are a little more spaced out and I feel like I move a little more fluidly around the front panel of the Pro 3 than on the Moogs, which is especially weird because I've had the 37 for a few years now, whereas the Pro 3 has been only with me for a couple of months. I think it's just that I feel that the Pro 3 offers more for the live performer to actually do while live performing be it tweak the touch bar on the side of the mod wheel or live tweak the effects or just playing around with the onboard sequencer can make for some really happy accidents. This is strange because as I said before when I started writing out my thoughts I was sure this is going to be a very close call since I absolutely adore my Subsequent 37 and it's been one of my favorite synths to program and play on for years but the more I break it down and the more I put my thoughts onto paper for you guys I've come to the conclusion that the king of my studio has been usurped and the Pro 3 truly reigns supreme. So my final recommendation is, unless you're looking for that specific sound that only the Subsequent 37 can give you, and believe me, that's a pretty strong enough reason to tip the scales, with all things considered, the Pro 3 just gives you way more bang for buck and in my opinion, is pretty much as close to the perfect synth as I think we're gonna get. To me, it represents the condensation of all the years and all the passion that Dave Smith had for synthesizers, and it absolutely shows as soon as you touch the first key. How about you? What do you think? Do you agree with me, or did I miss something important that makes the difference? I'd love to know what your favorite mono synth is, and I look forward to talking with you down in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video useful, or at least entertaining. Have a great week. I'll see you next time.